how could your relationships at age 50 predict whether you're gonna get type two diabetes in older age? Loneliness is a stressor. If you had one life choice to make right now that would set you on the path to future health and happiness, what would it be? It would be to invest your time and energy in people, in your relationships with other people. Wow. So really, it's not about what you're eating or how much you're exercising or making a lot of money or advancing yourself in the world, being famous, whatever it is that people think might be <laughs> linked to happiness and a good life. It's it's your connections, your community, your relationships. Well, let me unpack that just a bit, because when you said it's not about what you're eating or exercising, it is. And in fact, our study, our 85 year study of these people shows that taking care of your health is hugely important. So let's bracket that and say, no, health care, self care is really important. But the making a lot of money, the getting famous, the winning the Nobel Prize, that stuff doesn't make mm, you happier. Mm. Yeah. And in your TED talk, you were, you know, very, you know, direct about this. You were, you were saying essentially that it isn't any of those things, it's those relationships, but that loneliness was a killer. Loneliness is such a high risk factor for disease and death. It's, it's striking. I think we've had Dr. Uh, Vivek Murthy, who's the current Surgeon General on the podcast before, and he wrote a book about this and looked at all the research about this. And I'm curious, you know, you did this study called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. It's, I mean, you didn't start it. <laughs> it was started 80 years ago, but it was fascinating. They took, you know, young boys from the poorest, most underserved neighborhoods in Boston and then a bunch of Harvard dudes, so more privileged group. And you studied these people over a period of 80 years, uh, which is remarkable, uh, generations of people. And the study, you know, I mean, it's hard to do a study like that for, for 80 years, but somehow you guys have managed to keep it going. But you, so this loneliness framework was really interesting to me because if you're saying that the key to a good life is, is connections and relationships and happiness, the converse is that loneliness is actually a huge risk factor, right? Absolutely. And loneliness, as you know, is a subjective experience. So, you know, you can be lonely in a crowd. You can be lonely in an intimate relationship. You can be perfectly happy on a mountaintop as a hermit. It all depends on that subjective sense of whether I'm connected enough to the people I want to be connected to. And if I am connected enough, then I won't say that I'm lonely. Um, but I think that, you know, what we've learned and we're doing more research on this is that loneliness is a stressor, that loneliness uh -huh. actually keeps us in chronic fight or flight mode keeps our bodies revved up slightly because we're more vigilant to threat when we're lonely. And that seems to contribute a lot to breaking down health as well as happiness. Mm. So literally it's a physiological stress to be lonely and isolated. Exactly. Wow. Amazing. The, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the sort of brings me to the question of what is the biology of all of this. You're a psychiatrist and we were chatting before we started the podcast that, you know, typically psychiatrists pay no attention to the mind, the brain, uh, and focus on the mind, whereas neurologists focus on the brain and not the mind, but it's all connected. So how, how does connections and relationships foster health and how does loneliness biologically create disease and shorter lifespans? Cause that, that's fascinating to me as a, as a, functional medicine doctor, I kind of want to know the why and the cause. Absolutely. Well, let me give an example. So let's say you have something really upsetting happen during your day, right? And you find that you're thinking about it. You're kind of ruminating about it. And then at the end of the day, there's somebody you can talk to. Maybe somebody at home, or maybe you call somebody up, somebody who's a good listener, a sympathetic listener, you can literally feel your body calm down as you get to talk about it, right? And you can literally feel your body return to equilibrium from that fight or flight mode, that agitation. Um, because what we know is that when you're upset, that your body uh, secretes stress hormones, circulating levels of cortisol go up, 
uh, inflammation goes up, and then the body's meant to return to equilibrium. But what if you don't have anybody to talk to about what's upsetting you? And so what we find is that good relationships seem to be stress regulators. It's quite amazing. I think I, I know, you know, noticed when I was when I was researching in my book on longevity that I, I came upon a study that cuddling actually changes your epigenome. <laughs> That, that, you know, just physical affection and connection. And it's true, you, you, you know, when you're with people who you have a deep connection with, who love you, who, you know, their their nervous system is also sort of grounded, I would say, I, I just feel my nervous system start to kind of calm down at the same time. And I think that the data on all this, really around sociogenomics, which is what is the, the biology and the effects of our social relationships and connections on our gene expression and everything downstream from that that you talked about, like inflammation. It's really, it's quite amazing. And so this is, this is really an important study because it, it you know, wasn't focused so much on what makes people sick, but what makes people thrive, right? Exactly. What makes people live a long time and have a happy life. So, uh, what, what, uh, uh, was, uh, sort of the surprising and interesting findings? What were the surprising and interesting findings that you had from the study? What are the important lessons? that you learned in, about relationships in particular, but also in general, when you had this sort of, you know, 80 years of data on all these men who you studied. Yeah. Well, the the finding that relationships keep us happier and healthier was a surprise at first. They, it began to emerge in the 1980s. And at first, people running our study didn't believe the data. Because, yeah, we know the mind and the body are connected, but how could, it, you know, how yeah. could your relationships at age 50 predict whether you're going to get type 2 diabetes in older yeah. age or whether you're going to get arthritis? How could that possibly happen? And then other studies began to find the same thing. And that's, that's where we begin to believe it. So no one study, even my famous longitudinal study, 85 years, no one study of this kind can prove anything. But if you have many studies pointing in the same direction, then we begin to have much more confidence. And we began to say, my gosh, this is real. This is powerful. And so I think one of the things that surprised us is the finding that loneliness and poor quality relationships are as damaging to your health as cigarette smoking yeah as wow. obesity um so that these these things that we consider so dangerous for us are no more dangerous than isolation and loneliness yeah yeah and it's so interesting we have such a quote connected society but we're still often so isolated and disconnected from each other. You, you know, we have social media, but it doesn't feel very social. <laughs> it often drives more stress in our nervous systems than, than actually healing from the nature of the way we kind of interact. And it's just, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird moment, I think, in history where we've lost our tribal communities. We've lost our connections. We live in these nuclear families or these single parent families. I was a single parent. And, you know, we, we kind of navigate life in these little bubbles of, of uh, isolation. And, you know, it's unusual to see today, you know, big extended families and communities and, and, and it, you know, you have to really work at it. So I wonder, you know, how did, how did these people, um, actually cultivate it? And what were the life skills and hacks that allowed them to keep, maintain, build and nurture these relationships that actually determine their health span and their lifespan? Well, one thing to point out is that not everybody was successful at cultivating this. So some of the stories in our book, we have stories of our real participants and their names are disguised to protect their privacy, but we have stories about their lives and not all the stories are happy. Not all the stories have happy endings because some of these people weren't successful, but the ones who were seem to get it that making relationships a priority, no matter where you were, at home, at work, out in the community, that, that focusing on people really made a difference, really helped you cultivate this kind of well-being. And so some of our folks got it right away. Some of our folks learned that lesson as they got older, as they had mm -hmm. more life experience. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. You know, sort of thinking about 
my father, you know, and, um, and I, and I, you know, how isolated he was in, uh, I mean, he was married, but he really he kind of focused on his career and focused on being successful and kind of lost a lot of his friends and ended up, you know, really, really without a lot of friends as he got older. And then I invited him to this men's work. I've done men's work for 30 years and, and we had this thing called spirit camp and we, you know, we'd go up to this sort of camp, uh, like a YMCA camp on top of this mountain in the Berkshires. And, and I invited him to come and my friend invited his father to come. And they were both like the same age, 79 years old. And they were, they were both kind of New York Jews uh, from Brooklyn. They both were kind of atheists. <laughs> they both were, were, you know, joined the Navy at 17. They were very similar. And they were both tall, interesting characters. And they kind of bonded and developed this incredible friendship. And, and I saw how much it enriched my father's life. And, and even on his deathbed, like this guy, Jerry, his friend was calling him on the phone. And, you know, I just realized how important those things are. And, and we often don't prioritize them in our lives. And I think it sounds like, you know, the people in the study who prioritize them actually did much better. We asked our original people this question. We said, who could you call in the middle of the night if you were sick or scared? And some people couldn't list anybody. Oh, my goodness. Some people who were married couldn't list anybody. And then some people could list several people. You know, and I think what your dad found was a friend. He found a real friend who would call him when he was sick. Right? Yeah. And right. who would right. be there, who would have his back. And I think what one of the things we've learned is so powerful from our study is you know, what we call in my jargon, secure attachment, that when you feel like there's somebody in the world who's got your back, who you could go to if you were really in trouble, that's what each of us needs in order to thrive, in order to feel okay about our lives. Yeah, yeah it's true. You know, I, remember, I, I, I mean, I don't want to make this about me, but <laughs> just, you know, just reflecting on how true this is. I remember you know, when I was a little boy, I was very isolated. I was kind of a weird, nerdy kid and hid in my room, read a lot of books. You know, <laughs> it's paid yeah, off in the end. Yeah, me paid too. Off, paid off me in the too. end, but uh, me too. I, you know, I really didn't have anybody who who saw me as a kid. And then I went out west and I, I went backpacking. And I was eighteen. I met this guy on the top of this mountain, and we were both going to be in Ithaca in the fall. And you know, we we kind of bonded, and we we really had this incredible friendship for like forty five years. And he just, I'm in Baja, and he just left, and we had this, you know mountain biking trip here and you know we talked and we we just like i don't i he's been such an integral part of my life uh throughout everything and has helped me feel like i have that secure attachment like i have somebody to call and and now i've obviously developed many many more people i could call but it's it's having that gave me a sense of being okay like that somehow life was quite different before and after that experience so i don't know how to tell people to form those attachments or how do you find those people? How do you build that? Like, I just wonder if there were any insights from the study about how to actually create it. Cause you can say, Oh, I want you to eat more vegetables. Okay. I got that. Oh, I want you to exercise more. Okay. I got that. But like, I want you to have a deeper connections and relationships. Like how do you get here to there if you're in that isolation stage? Well, one thing is to be active. So you and your friend had to arrange that he would come be with you in Baja, right? You had yeah. to, you both had to go out of your way. You had to carve out the time. You had to make the arrangements. You had to be active. And I think one of the things many of us, myself included, can fall into is the sense of, oh, my good friends are my good friends. The, the friendships will take care of themselves. I don't really have to do anything. And what we came to understand from our research is, is something that, that we're thinking about as a kind of social fitness analogous mm. to physical fitness mm. where, you know, you work out one day and then you don't say to yourself, well, I've done that. I don't have to do that ever again. <laughs> right. You don't do that. Right. Really? And the I ate one vegetable. Is, I don't good now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you don't do that. You say, okay, I need to, I need to have a routine. I need to, this is a practice, both of self care, you know, of diet, of exercise, but also a a self self caring practice of tending to important relationships. So, so part of it is actively maintaining the relationships that you've built. 
to make sure they stay close, get closer. Another then is if you're isolated, to find ways to have contact with people. And often one of the best ways is to have contact around a shared interest. So you happened to meet your friend on a mountaintop, which meant that you were both interested, at least that day, in taking a hike, right? In backpacking, we were backpacking, right? yeah. 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 So, and you could connect around the trail, around nature. You could share things, right? So what if you volunteer for a cause you're passionate about? And so you might be shy, but if you're, if you're right next to people who also care about climate change or about um, saving the world in some other way or about gardening or about golf. Fish, fishing anything. or whatever, right. Fishing, anything. Um, that, that what you find is that the shared interest provides a place to start conversations. And that by starting those conversations, you can begin to get to know someone. Uh, I'll say one more thing, which we find constantly, is that bringing curiosity is a huge benefit to making a relationship. So we all ah. love it when somebody is curious about us. Yeah. Like, you know, Mark, if, if I ask you more about yourself, you'll want to talk about it, right? Uh, you know, you asked me about my Zen life and I told you about it a little bit before we started this, this, this podcast. And, and so what we find is that when you ask people about themselves, they feel your interest, they feel seen. And when they get to tell you about themselves, they feel known and so if you can just bring bring curiosity, you don't have to bring anything else. Uh, notice something, you know, I noticed something in your Zoom background, in your, you know, <laughs> um, notice something that's on a coworker's desk, you know, a photo or a little object. Just be curious and you will strike up conversations that turn out to be meaningful. You know, Robert, I think you just hit on something so fundamental. Um, which is, is that all of us want really one thing, which is to be seen and known and heard and gotten, you know, and how rare that is uh, and how simple it is to actually create that experience for someone by just being curious about them. Tell me more about yourself or ask, like, you know, like I, and I went to dinner with some friends here in Mexico. I said, so how did you guys meet? What's your love story? And then the whole, like, it was like an hour and a half <laughs> conversation and it was great it was so entertaining and fun and you know they felt like we cared about them and it deepened our connection and so i think i think it's not that hard to do but uh, so many of us are just tired and burnt out and focused on what we have to do and getting through the next thing and you know on our own lives and but but stopping that and taking a breath and and actually figuring out how to get curious about the people in your life will a hundred percent create real connection. So that's a, such a beautiful, beautiful nugget. And I think we don't, we kind of lost the art of questions. I have a friend, Andrew, who's like, he's like the master. Like he'll just go in and ask you these piercing questions that you know, literally, you, you know, probably may or may not want to share with anybody, but right. like they get, they get to the real essence of what matters and what you care about and who you are. And, and those are, now they're just talking about the weather or whatever. It's like having a more, a more deeper sense of, of inquiry about another person's heart and soul and mind. It's a beautiful, it's beautiful. So that's a great yes. nugget. Um, you know, the other thing we can do is we can do that with people we think we know really well. So research tells us another interesting thing. So how, how much do you know your partner? Let's say you're in an intimate partnership. What they find is that we're most attuned to our partner's feelings when we first get together. Because think about it. You're trying to figure out, is this person into me? Like what's going on with this person, right? So you're really paying attention. And then what they find is that partners know each other less well. They know each other's feelings less accurately the longer they're in the relationship. You would think it would be the opposite. So, so, the, so one of the tips that we find we can give to people for livening up old relationships is to bring that curiosity to a relationship to to somebody you feel you know everything about like the, the one of my zen teachers taught me this the the instruction at, in a meditation was what's here right now that i have never noticed before 
And if you could bring that curiosity to, you know, having dinner with your longtime partner, that could get you into a much more interesting and interested space. It's so true. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of this incredible, like, uh, um, little game that um, my my friend Esther Perel created. Um, and it's, it's this beautiful um, little kit. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes, but essentially it's a, it's a game where you have pull out a card and then you ask questions about your partner or about your friends. And so you get to these deeper things. And I've, I've done this before with people I'm very, very close with. And it's like, I just learned stuff I wouldn't have known about them, right? There's that New York Times article about the 36 questions to ask to fall in love, right? You know, those oh, questions. I haven't <laughs> seen that. They're great. You can, we'll put those in the show notes too, but it's great. There's like really questions about asking to discover what someone's like. So I, I just want to take a little bit of a left turn, Robert, here, because I think, you know, the other side of loneliness is happiness. The, the book you created about the study, this was 80 year study that detailed the, the things that you found about creating a healthy, happy, long life. Um, was sort of science of the antidote to loneliness and the antidote to, um, you know, what creates disease, which was sort of happiness. But then the question there is, how do we get to happiness and what creates happiness? And in, and in your life, you, you you sort of were sharing with me before the podcast that about 18 years ago, you had the opportunity to meet someone who was a Zen master, what we call a Roshi, a teacher, essentially. And it changed how you saw the world, changed how you thought about yourself, changed the quality of your life and happiness. And, you know, Buddhism is really um, a description of the mind and what creates suffering, right? And so the science of suffering is sort of, is, is, is important to understand to kind of create the science of happiness. So your book is really on the science of happiness, but, but your, your, your Zen studies really help you in a way get there through the science of suffering, right? And how to relieve suffering and why we suffer and what the cause of suffering are. So I'd love for you to sort of maybe take us down that journey of how as a psychiatrist from Harvard, you kind of got into this seemingly world that doesn't fit with Freudian psychoanalysis Absolutely. in my mind. And I'm like, okay, how do you reconcile that? And where did you get to? And what are you, who are you now? And, and how is this, how is, how is this incredible project that you've been involved with informed all of that? Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> it's a lot, I know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot, but it's a wonderful question. And and I, I'm so glad. Thank you for the curiosity, Mark. Um, so, <laughs> Well, I mean, just as a little background, everybody, I, I don't know if people listening know, but I, in my major in college was Asian studies, and my focus was on Buddhism. And I did a lot of studies of Zen Buddhism and all kinds of Tibetan Buddhism, but and practiced. And so I really very curious about this kind of connection. Yes. Well, you know, what happened for me so I grew up in a family that really valued education. So they loved it when I got A's and, you know, when I get awards in school and stuff. Right. And, and what I began to realize, we read a poem once by Yeats about a man who comes across a fallen statue in the desert of some great conqueror. And the musing that he does, that Yeats does, is about what's happened to this great conqueror. You know, he was so mighty in his time, and where is it all now? And I began to sort of feel, really feel this, this fact that, you know, most, most of us are not going to be remembered a hundred years from now. It's all going to go away. So what really matters? And here I am, a guy who spent his whole adult life at Harvard, right? And, you know, I've got- Yeah, you never left. You're like undergraduate from medical left. school, you're a, teaching that. <laughs> exactly. And I have a resume as long as your arm. I've won lots <laughs> of awards. And none of it, I mean, I, I'm I'm happy with the work I did. And and yes, I'm I'm proud of some of it, but that's not what really matters. It's not what really warms me. And so this problem of why- why do we all care about some of these things like badges of achievement or wealth or, you know, that really don't matter ultimately? Why is it that we humans do that? And, and Buddhism helped me. So sitting and meditating and realizing how my mind creates all these stories about what's important, stories that, that don't matter, don't amount to a hill of beans, right? Um, that, that 
that was so helpful and so healing for me. And I could let mm. go of some of the pressure to, to achieve, to be something special because mm. none of us at the, in the deep, at the deepest level, all of us are special and none of us is special. All yeah. of us are just part of a great big universe doing what it does. And, and this has been an, an enormously healing perspective for me. It's helped me let go of some of my preoccupations. It's amazing. How, how, how does it inform your psychiatric practice? It does. It does a lot. So my specialty is psychotherapy. And so I'm a little bit unusual as a psychiatrist because a lot of psychiatrists do mostly medication work. I do mostly psychotherapy, although prescribed medication. Uh, but um, what it does is it helps me bring in and ask people about the perspective of, you know, 10 years from now, when you're looking back, how are you, how important is this going to seem? Or, you know, 80 years from now, when people remember you, what do you want them to remember? It's that kind of existential mm. perspective that mm. Zen helps me bring. Mm. Mm. And I find that it helps many of the people I work with kind of put things in a bigger perspective and calm down about some of the small stuff. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that the, the sort of little, little tangent here, but you know, the studies on, on meditators, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've read the book altered traits by Daniel Goldman and, um, and, and his colleague who's, who's studied the MRI of meditators who are Olympic meditators who literally 40,000 hours of meditation and what their brains look like. And, and there's a sort of part of the brain that sort of, re, sort of diminishes the strength of the ego, like the, the ego kind of part of the brain is quieted called the default mode network. And that is also what's kind of quieted down with these new psychedelic therapies, these sort of psilocybin, MDMA compounds that seem to do very similar things that are being used in psychiatric treatment, like depression and anxiety and PTSD and addiction. And it's fascinating to me how you know, we're kind of in this world where we're, we're starting to sort of rethink about how we deal with this sort of trauma and suffering, right? So it's hard for people to think about like meditating for 40,000 hours, like living in a cave for nine years. You know, I think people do that. I certainly haven't, and I don't think I can, but I think there's, there's ways that people can get to kind of calming that down. But even, even a meditation practice alone, that does help you to kind of have perspective on the, monkey mind they call it and the the ways in which our thoughts create suffering and i think once you get that you realize wow i can change my level of happiness and my my well-being by changing my relationship to my thoughts and not thinking of them as things or as these fixed entities that actually kind of are real but that are just constructs of my mind that create suffering for myself and i could change those yes and, you know, you don't need 80,000 hours of meditation to get this, as I think you know, you know, you that that some meditation can give us those experiences of, of, of feeling connected to the bigger world and not not locked in. There's a phrase that David Foster Wallace used where he would say, we are trapped in our skull sized kingdoms. And what meditation helps us do, and also some of these psychedelic drugs is to really experience the feeling of connection to something much bigger and that that feeling doesn't last. So, you know, you can't be on psychedelic drugs all the time. You wouldn't want to be, you can't be meditating all the time and you can't dictate what kind of experience no. you're going to have on the cushion, no. but having those experiences gives us something to touch back to, to remember like, Oh yeah. There's that perspective too. When I'm all caught up in my little personal drama, I can like remember, oh yeah, yeah. I know what it feels like to be connected to this bigger world. Yeah. And that part of that's where happiness comes from, right? I mean, I think the question is how, how much of happiness is really under control? Sometimes I've sort of heard the, and read some of the research that shows that whether wherever you are, your sort of happiness endpoint is fairly fixed. Like if you win the lottery or if you get your legs chopped off in an accident, like you kind of revert back to whatever your baseline level of happiness is after the initial stress of the event. Um, but you're suggesting that there's a way to actually 
you know, shift our, our set point in happiness? How yes. do we do that? Well, I think through these practices that we're talking about, so meditation can do that, but also meditation like experiences, um, you know, yoga, uh, for some people it's through music. Um, it, where, where you really get beyond the self and just get absorbed in what you're doing. Um, for some people, it's gardening. You know, there are just a whole lot of ways that you can be very present in the moment. Um, and time just flies when you are. And that finding those ways, not everybody needs to meditate. You know, not, there's no one size doesn't fit all, but finding a practice that really connects you with the present moment and with the world is one way to help change your happiness set point and also taking care of yourself. So, you know, much of your work is about taking care of the body, of, of building health, right? And one of the things we know is that when you take care of your body, we suffer less, our mood is better, our well-being is greater. And so these are ways that we can influence that set point that we all have. Yeah, I think it's true. I think, you know, I think, you know, we sort of alluded to before, but the the mind, body, body, mind is sort of an artificial distinction. The, 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 the brain function also determines your mind's function, the, the, the disorder or order of your neurons and then your neuroplasticity and the level of inflammation and the level of toxins and the hormones and the, yeah. you know, the microbiome, all this stuff that we talk about in functional medicine has a profound impact on the brain function, which has an effect on your mind's function. So I always say it's a lot easier to get enlightened if you're not mercury poison, your thyroid's working and you're not B12 deficient, you know, like it, exactly. it's a lot easier. So um, I want to kind of loop back to this whole concept of social fitness, because I think understanding the general concept, which is, you know, the, the, the social fitness is really the, the metric of how much and how good and how well your relationships function and, and the quality of those relationships. But the, the question is, you know, I know how to get my body in fitness, but how do I, how do I keep in good shape from, <laughs> from the perspective of my social fitness? Well, a couple of things. One is to not be plagued by grudges, to not be plagued by feuds. If you think about it, we can invest so much energy in, in angry division uh, from the people in our lives, especially in families. Oh boy, there are so many family feuds and they take such a toll on us. And so one of the things that we can do is first of all, to recognize that conflicts are inevitable in any relationship where people care about each other. You're not always going to agree. There are going to be arguments. Um, but then to notice, okay, how much is this taking a toll on me? How much space is it occupying in my mind? And could I go back and try to ease that? Could I try to work out my differences with somebody in my life who's really preoccupying me? Um, and so to do that can go a long way to freeing up energy um, that we've been wasting on feuds often that are not about meaningful things. You know, take that, you know, that hundred years from now criterion and say, is it really going to matter? Yeah. Uh, if he didn't yeah. invite me to Thanksgiving <laughs> 12 years ago. Right. And, um, and so there's that now, again, that it's also true that we need to step away from abusive relationships. So I'm not saying every relationship can be healed. That's clear. But many relationships are, um, are just chronically unhappy and acrimonious. And, and what I would say is if you can invest the time in healing and working out differences, it's a huge, it's a great investment. Yeah. That's an incredible piece of advice. That's a great yeah. piece of advice. So I just said, before you go to the next bit of advice, it reminds me of the saying that resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Exactly. That's exactly it. And and so to to really first know that, 
to know how much it hurts, right? It's like, I think the Buddha likened it to picking up a hot coal. And then, mm, you know, mm. when, when you realize what it's doing to you, how much it hurts, you let it go. So it's forgiveness, if, right? To, forgiveness yeah, for compassion, forgiveness. understanding the other person's perspective, you know, just trying to get them yeah. without necessarily having to be right or wrong, but understanding what, what led to that behavior exactly. or that action or that whatever, right? Exactly. And in, in Zen, we talk a lot about the mind of right and wrong. And is there a way to step beyond the mind of right and wrong, where it's not important to be right or wrong mm -hmm. in so many instances? Yeah, that's so true. Um, I, I had a great business coach once. He said, do you want to be right or do you want to be in relationship? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that is good. That is good. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. And so it's really key to to think about that and to try to to bring more kind of compassion and acceptance to the fact that we're all going to be different and we're not going to please each other all the time. And these things can be worked with and often mended. So see, we're going to, you're going to talk about some other things. I don't know if it connects to this model you have in the book called the wiser model, W I S E R of reacting yeah. to really emotionally challenging situations. Why it's so helpful because you know, it's, it, you know, you, you know, when you're talking about social fitness, you sort of talk about forgiveness and compassion, trying to understand this perspective, letting go. And, and there's more, more to this. So take us through this model that you have of what actually creates social fitness. Cause I'm imagining that's what this is, right? Sure. Well, the wiser model, actually, it was developed initially by a psychologist named Ken Dodge, who was trying to look at how kids can get better at social relationships like in the schoolyard for example and he what he developed was this system that now we've kind of dubbed the wiser model which is really a way of slowing down your processing of a difficult situation or a challenging situation so let's say something ambiguous happens somebody gives you a look and you don't understand it or they send you a note saying I need to talk to you right away and you don't know why, right? So there's a big blank screen. Well, think about all the ways our minds can fill in the blank screen, right? And say, oh my gosh, he wants to talk to me because he's mad at me. He wants to talk to me because I'm going to be fired. He wants to talk to, you know, you can, you can just do it. I'm getting that, a raise right? or I'm so exactly. great. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, uh, or my, you know, or something happens at a family gathering, right? And you don't understand why the person did what they did. So the wiser model is a way of simply slowing down your response. And so it starts with, it's an acronym. The W is really just a, a, an acronym. It's a, it's a way of saying watch. So first of all, watch. look at what's happened. Watch. So see, okay. What just happened? So this person said, I need to talk to you right away. And they had a serious look on their face. And watch watch what your mind does with it. Okay, so I'm saying, oh my gosh, they're mad at me. They're going to call me on the carpet for something, right? And then think about, okay, what are some of the other possibilities? Maybe this person needs to talk to me right away because their kid's in trouble and they want some advice. Or maybe, maybe they just got a health scare. Or maybe, you know, just think about all the other possibilities. Rather than going into that meeting, that talk, saying, oh my God, they're going to call me on the carpet. Okay, so first watch. And then think about, okay, what interpret. What could this mean? So, well, it could mean a whole bunch of different things that this person wants to talk to me right away. And so keep all those possibilities in mind. And then you think, okay, how do I respond? So let's say you get this message saying, I want to talk to you right away. What are some of the possibilities? I could say, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you uh, right away because I'm scared. Um, you could say, uh, what's wrong? Or I didn't do anything. Or, you know, so there are all kinds of ways you could respond. Um, so for the, so the select is you select, well, what would be a good response in this case? So it might just be sure. Happy to talk to you. When's a good time, right? Rather than getting all defensive or all worried about something that may not exist. And then you engage. So then you 
you choose your response like a friendly, yes, happy to talk, let's make a time right away. You engage and then you see what happens. You see what the meeting is like and you reflect back and say, oh, actually it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It was something different. Um, or when that person looked like they were mad at me, actually they weren't. They were just upset about something happening in their own life, right? And so what this is, the wiser model, is just a way to get us to slow down, really pay attention, really choose how we're going to respond rather than doing the first knee-jerk thing. Then react, respond and react. rather than react. Right. Re respond rather than react. And then to look back and say, how did that work? How did that work out? So that we learn from it. Because sometimes, you know, I do send that angry email response and then it's like, oh my gosh. So the important thing is when you screw up, which I do sometimes, to reflect back and say, okay, that didn't work. I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do something different because we want to keep learning from our experiences and, and we're not going to get it right all the mm. time. No, you know? it's so true. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, my experience is that, you know, your thought creates a feeling or emotion that creates an action and, and there's multiple steps in there. And they often are just collapsed, right? They just they just are in a nanosecond and we think they're all one thing. But you're talking about slowing that whole process down. It sort of reminds me of Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning, where he said, you know, between stimulus and response, there's a choice. And in that choice lies your freedom. You know, it's, it's, so we have uh, an opportunity to kind of check in and just stop that automatic reactivity that is our limbic brain, our reptile brain, just creating this fear response, fear, fight, flight, freeze, whatever it is, you know, I think those, those things are, are, are fixable. And so the question I would have for you is for people listening is how do you, how do you slow down? Like, how do you, do you take a breath? Do you, do you like, you know, kind of have a rubber band you snap on your wrist to remember like what, yeah. what, what do you do? Cause it's kind of in that moment to just, Kind of in reset. That moment, right. Yeah. So in that moment, for first of all, it depends. Sometimes we just have to respond, right? You see a challenge and you just have to, you know, like, like someone pulls out in front of you and you have to step on the brake. I mean, you don't stop and think, well, how could I respond to this? No, you don't do that. <laughs> so sometimes you just respond and then you, and you look at it la later. But sometimes if you can buy time, buy time. And that might mean, um, don't, you know, the temptation is to respond right away with the, the email, uh, when someone puts you on the defensive. So, so stop and, or, or to, to immediately say, okay, I gotta do this. If you can buy time, would it matter if I slept on this? And if I responded tomorrow morning, if you can do that, sleep on it. It's, it really makes a difference because the world can look very different. 12 hours later, 24 hours later. And if you can do that, and often we can, mm. take time. Um, if you can't take time, and sometimes even with a person, so let's say you're in a conversation and, and I say something upsetting to you, you might be able to say, you know, I don't really know how I feel right now about that. I don't know how to respond. Can, can we talk about this again tomorrow? Or can we, you know, can I just have a few minutes or an hour to think about this, just to, to ask for time. And most of the time people will give you that time, you know, most often they will. And because it, what you're saying, the Victor Frankl uh, observation is so important that you want to give yourself the time to have choice mm, mm. to first of all, see, okay, there are options and here's the option that I think might be the best. And in, in the, in the study you did, the the Harvard study of adult development, this eighty or that you're doing, <laughs> and then we'll maybe be done for another eighty We're years. Still doing it. Um, you know, did you find that the people who were able to do that better naturally ended up having happier, longer lives and also better relationships? Did you did you measure for that or look for that at all? Yes, we did it indirectly. We didn't ask them how often do you use the wiser model. No, but, no, no. I mean, I did. Did. No, no, no. I understand. <laughs> I understand. But the people who could reflect and say, well, I think 
this person may have done this because of that, because they were struggling with this. Or, you know, the people who can really uh, try to put themselves in someone else's shoes, try to entertain multiple possibilities, that those were the people. These are, this is what, what comes under the rubric of, under the umbrella of emotional intelligence. You know, if we think about Dan Goleman's whole big category of emotional intelligence, it's these kinds of skills that we're talking about with the wiser model and other skills as well. And the people who had those skills were the most successful in their work lives too, as well as at home and in the community. Mm. Yeah, so true. You know, you, you mentioned something earlier on in our conversation about you know, relationships and, and marriages and how being even in a, even in a relationship, if it's not one that's nourishing or loving or connected, if it's toxic or abusive or just unhappy, how that can be actually uh, more of a detriment to your health than actually being alone. And, and so the question I have is, you know, from these studies that you did and the study that you're doing, how how do you find that people had healthy romantic relationships? How do we nourish romantic relationships? Because those are often the most challenging for us, the, the, the most difficult to navigate, and where our old traumas and our old beliefs and our old woundings as children often emerge and come out in you know technicolor. So how do we how do we navigate that, and how do these people navigate that? So the so that that's such a such an important question. So how do we navigate relationships? One of the things that I think is most useful is the concept that no relationship is going to serve all our needs, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's a colleague of mine, Eli Finkel, who's wrote, written a book called The All or Nothing Marriage. And what he talks about is this ideal, especially in the West, uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries, where we have this romantic ideal that we're going to find the partner who does everything for us, who supplies us with all our needs, needs for sex and fun and companionship and intellectual stimulation. And what we know is that no one relationship can provide all those needs. That's highly unlikely. And so I think first, recognizing that it, there's nothing wrong with needing to have other relationships that provide us with some of what we need. That if we don't go in with the expectation of why can't you be more of this for me, that that can go a long way to easing some of the pressure we feel and some of the worry we feel that, well, this isn't a good enough relationship. Um, and so the idea, the expectation could be, I'm going to get much of what I need from this intimate relationship, but not all of what I need. And we're, we're each going to find things elsewhere. Um, and then two other concepts. One is conflict is inevitable, inevitable. And so it's not, it's not a matter of, do we argue? Do we disagree? The, the real question is, can we develop ways of navigating disagreements so that we both come out feeling okay so that we neither of us feels like we've lost neither of us feels shamed that we both come out feeling like we're okay with each other mm. and with mm. ourselves mm. Um, yeah and, what and else? there was another thing you were gonna say and there was oh gosh um <laughs> Now, so, so one was that conflict is inevitable. And oh, and the other thing is that we change. So, right. So my, my field is adult development. And if you think about it, think about how much you've changed since you were in your twenties. I mean, there are many ways in which you are quite different and what you care about is quite different. So remember that you're going to change over time and your partner is going to change over time. So the question is, how can you grow both separately and together, rather than assuming, well, you have to stay, you have to be exactly the same person you were when we got together, because that can't happen. So expecting change, expecting conflicts and finding ways to work them out, and expecting that you're going to get some of your needs met in other relationships. Mm. And is that what you found in this study, that that people had a diverse 
array of social connections that it wasn't just like one person, but they had, you know, a community that supported them to feel this social network that helped them live a long time. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that, you know, one of the things we know from our study and others is that all kinds of relationships contribute to our well-being. You don't have to be in an intimate re- partnership to get these benefits that I'm talking about. So friendships, uh, family relationships, also casual relationships. We've started studying. Uh, you don't mean an affair. You mean like. <laughs> no, somebody, no, I don't mean like an someone affair. someone at the grocery what I, store. <laughs> what I mean, exactly. Someone at the grocery store who checks you out and you see over and over again, the person who you get your coffee from at Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks, right? The barista. Um, that, that those little hits of positive energy that we get from saying hi to each other, from, from asking, how's your day going? And really wanting to know, um, that those little hits of affirmation make a difference. And so we don't want to downplay the importance of those casual connections that we have. Mm. Even and, and, talking to strangers makes us yeah. happier. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I'm always, uh, when I was younger, I just, I loved kind of going up to random people and just like digging in and finding who are you and what's your story. And like, yeah. and it's just fascinating whether it's a homeless person or whether it's, you know, someone on a train or a bus or, you know, there's always a moment where, you know, we, we sort of live in these little bubbles and even when we're in public or we're, we're sort of contracted into our phones <laughs> these days. And, and it's, you know, it just, it's just like, uh, I, I try to sort of make an effort of just kind of having this these just juicy little interactions where our common humanity is recognized and where we feel like a little bit of a sense of connection to another human in the greater human family. It's like a very powerful like medicine, I would say. I would say it is medicine. Yeah, I, I I worked a lot with Rick Warren, this community based stuff faith-based wellness program we did it in groups in a church and and we, you know the basic message was community is medicine right food is medicine but community is also medicine and that's what i found when i went to sardinia and icaria and some of the blue zones that these deep social connections and relationships they've had are so determined of their quality of happiness and i i see it even for myself you know i i talked about this before in the podcast but during covid you know we were all were kind of isolated and you know, i realized i had a whole group of men friends that i would see periodically and often not together, but most of them knew each other. Our friends were also really close friends. And we've been friends from between 45 and you know anywhere from 45 to 25 years in the group. And you know, we decided to meet every week for a couple hours on Zoom. And it's been the most amazing thing because it's like, uh, I don't know, I, I, it's like touchstone where every week we get to check in, we get to see each other, we we celebrate each other's wins, we, we, we cry with each other, we challenge each other to like, look at our crap and shit together, you know, and it's, it's such a beautiful, um, therapeutic experience. And it's, doesn't, it's not like therapy, but it's just, it's just the ability to actually be with people who see you and love you and know you and get you. It's like, it's, exactly. like so, it's so simple and it's such a neglected thing in our society today. And this book, the good life uh, lessons from the world's longest scientific study of happiness is, is, is kind of a reminder that this is, sort of the neglected medicine that we have available to us that can help us both live healthier longer and longer lives and and happier lives, right? Yes. So, I mean, it's all connected, health, happiness, longevity. And I, it's, it's so important. And it's Absolutely. such an important reminder of how to live and this you know, good life. You know what we know, Mark, it's such an important point because what we know, for example, is that when you are more connected to other people, you take better care of your health. That it matters to you more because staying staying healthy for someone else matters. Um, when they did a study of uh, people in retirement, what they found was they, they did this, this set of public service announcements trying to get older people to exercise, and particularly older women um, who were retired. And when they when they told them about all the dangers of not exercising, it didn't move the needle at all. Nobody exercised more. But when they showed pictures of grandmothers holding babies and said, be there for the people who matter to you, 
exercise rates went up. (laughs) And so what we find is that when you're more connected and you're more aware of those connections, you take better care of yourself. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I think it's true. I think it's really true. And, you know, I think you're, what I say, you're you're only as, you know, the reflection of the five closest people in your life in terms of your health and your habits and happiness. And, you know, if you're all your friends are, you know, just, you know, eating at McDonald's and watching soap operas all day, then, you know, (laughs) you're likely not going to be as healthy but if all your friends are you know going to yoga and meditating and you know eating healthy food and hiking and you're going to be you know drawn into that uh, and i think uh it's really it's really really true that we sort of we, we're not chameleons per se as human beings but we like to belong and we all have a longing to belong and longing to connect and so you know find find that like you said find those places and people in the community that where you have something in common with where you shared interests where you're active it's it's a, it's really an active process to build relationships, get out there, do stuff. And I think it's kind of hard because when you're lonely and isolated and depressed, it's hard to actually come out of that to go do something. Uh, and it's, it's sometimes challenging for people, and especially in this world that's so divisive and and um, the disconnection is getting even worse and worse. And it, it troubles me. Um, and and I think this this book is such a good reminder of of what we have to do to actually live fulfilled yeah. and happy lives. <laughs> You know what? I, if I'm really disturbed by the divisiveness, as you are. I mean, a lot. And one of the things I've come to to realize is that there are people I can listen to who make me feel more open to the world. And there are other people I listen to who make me feel more shut down. And if we can keep turning our attention, giving our attention to the people who help us feel more open to the world and to possibility and to others, that that's the place to offer the most precious thing we have, which is attention, right? And that that to turn away from those voices that make us feel more frightened, more closed off. Yeah. I think you just hit on something so profound, which is the quality of our attention to others, the quality of our attention to ourselves, the the ability to be curious and interested in others and not self-absorbed, it, you know, is, is actually what creates happiness, right? Yeah. Uh. yeah one, <laughs> one of my Zen teachers has this quote that I love. He said, attention is the most basic form of love. Yeah. Yeah. It's John it's, Tarrant. And what he, yeah. man, do, you know, if you think about it, what, what do we have that's more precious than our Mm. undivided Mm. attention. Mm. And also these days, more and more rare to give somebody our undivided attention. Yeah, it's so important. It's so important. And that's a quality of listening. There's actually a skill to listening to someone without judgment, with curiosity, with openness, without having your narrative running in your head about what you're going to say or what you want about your stuff or whatever it is. And I'm I'm guilty of that as anybody else. But the more I (laughs) learned to sort of drop myself and just really, because I I mean, I don't even talk about myself. I know myself. I know what I I know what's in my head. But like, I, I have such a deeper, richer experience when I, you know, like I inquire, like I said, you know, at, at, um, dinner with these friends the other night, I have this, you know, just a deeper sense of this human being. And I felt enriched by his story and, and her story and, and other, you know, things they shared about their, their spiritual growth and their development and how they're navigating things. And it's like, it adds so much to me by actually <laughs> being present and curious. And I, you know, I recently, um, you know, had a kind of a rude reminder of, you know, the habits that I can fall into, which is, you know, sort of writing this book and, you know, recording the audiobook and running my PBS show, just like being super busy, I kind of depleted myself and I couldn't be present for the people in my life. And they reflected that back to me and they were right. And I'm like, you know, if I was out of, if I was running on fumes, I, I couldn't show up. So part of exactly. actually having high quality relationships is self care, is actually rest, is actually nourishing yourself so you can show up and be whole when you meet somebody and connect with somebody. Exactly. Exactly. It's so important. You know, and one of the reasons why I have never let my Zen practice go is because it's one of those places I keep coming back to that grounds me, that reminds me, oh, attention is so important. Being present for my life and for people is so important. And if there are ways you can find to remind yourself of that, it doesn't have to be meditation. It could be other things 
but 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 that's such a key reminder so that y- you stay on a path that's going to keep you healthy and present for the people you love. What other sort of insightful lessons were there in the study of, of adult development that you did at Harvard and that's been going on for 80 years? What were the other nuggets you may want to share? Okay, th- this is one I really like. When our original folks were in their 80s, we asked them to look back over their lives and we asked them, what are you proudest of and what do you regret the most? And there were really consistent themes. And these were hundreds of people, right? And the consistent theme for what they were proudest of was about relationships. People invariably said, I was a good parent. I uh, I mentored people at work and it really mattered to me. I was a good friend. Um, they never said, you know, I won this prize or I rose to this position or I made this amount of money. Nobody I answered all my stuff. emails. My outbox is empty. <laughs> my outbox is always empty. My inbox, no, my inbox is empty. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> n- nobody, nobody did that. And the, the most common regret was about emptying your inbox. It was, you know, if it, many people said, I wish I hadn't spent so much time at work and I wish I had spent more time with the people I love and care about. Um, and there was one more regret, and this was more common for women than for men. The regret was, I wish I hadn't spent so much time worrying about what other people thought. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's kind of that's about being one. more true to oneself. Yeah, living a more authentic life, right? Yeah. Oh, well, beautiful. Well, I think this is such a an important message at this time where I think there's increasing unhappiness, increasing depression in the world, disconnection, and that, you know, the answer in, in many ways, despite what's happening in the world, despite the challenges we're having, despite the the, the sort of increasing divisiveness in the world, is that, you know, focusing on just cultivating a few relationships. It doesn't have to be many, you know, just a few good relationships and investing time in those relationships is, is such an important part of well-being and of health and of longevity. And, and it's just often very neglected. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. Our loneliness is an independent risk factor for, uh, for getting ill faster and for dying uh, of illness faster you know and it's it's um, probably as significant as smoking 15 cigarettes